So we're gonna uh, today we're gonna be uh, talk hold on a second before I yield. that um you know what I changed my mind Tim give me that water <laughs> give me give me give me that water yeah I, well I, I tend to do that from time to time All right today's message is uh um I got a title to it called salvation is simple and religion is hard and Tim just gave me a good example there of uh of what it uh of what salvation looks like. Here he was. He was trying to. He was trying to give me this here water, and you tell you what I did. I said, No, 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 no. I don't want that water just yet. Now, in all honesty, I told him. I said, Hey, I want you to hand me this water when I ask for it. And he messed up. He butchered it right there. But yeah, it, it gave me a better example here. So I'm. It just worked out. This is what, whatever was on you to make you move up there. I'm assuming was the Holy Spirit because. What happens is God reaches out, this is how simple it is, and He tries to offer you this free gift, and what do we do with it? No, 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 not right now. I'm not ready. That's what we do. But it's as simple as taking that gift and receiving that gift. I didn't, I didn't need that water. I, I've been sitting up here thirsting to death thinking, oh, this will be a good idea to, to kind of give you guys. I, I've been, I mean, I've been thirsty too. But it's as simple as, as taking what's offered. All right. Uh, if you will, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. I don't know if I told you the title yet or not. My brain's getting to slipping. From, but it's, the title is Salvation is Simple, Religion is Hard. If for anybody that wants to steal the sermon, just change the title. You can use the same text. It'll be okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. All right, somebody say amen when you got it. Amen. The Bible's like mine, be on page 1387. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Uh, jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his uh, sub subtly, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name of all names, God. We just thank you today, Lord, for being in your house, Lord. We thank you today for uh, being able to be in your word, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the access that we have to your word, God. We thank you for, for all that you do, Lord. We thank you for the, the youngins that were praying this morning, Lord. Lord, we just ask if there be one under the sound of your voice that's ever been confused about salvation, they can get it cleared up today, God. Lord, we pray that if there's somebody that, that has doubts, Lord, that they can, they can leave here uh, doubt-free, God. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for sending your Son down on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we get to talking about salvation today, I, I want us to take a moment and I want us to consider that there's hundreds, possibly thousands of different Christian denominations in the world. It's hard to put an exact number on it because when you start looking into the numbers of how many denominations they are, they break the best guesses they have there are are really bigger than what they are to guess. The, the, Recently, there's, um, there's been a study done that would say that there's 45,000 Christian denominations. The study is a little off because they're considering if you have the identical denomination in a different country, they're considering it two different denominations. So it's, it's quite significantly less than that. But I, I guess for the, for the academic side of it and for how they're defining what, defining what a denomination is, then I guess it's right at 45,000 just split up all over the place. It's, it's probably, um, I would imagine, uh, closer to, uh, to 5,000. But either way, 
That's a lot of denominations. When we start looking in just in America, there's so many of them, and, and denominations are not um, uh, exclusive to our nation. They're they're all over the world. They've they've all. I mean, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but Christianity is not exclusive to America. You know, you, there's some people that that really believe that uh, that believe that it is. There's some people that for some reason. They think that growing up in America makes them a Christian. Well, it doesn't. That's far from it. The only thing I've ever really agreed with Barack Obama on was when he said this is not a Christian nation. He was right about it. It was founded under Judeo-Christian values, but this has long since been a Christian nation. There's still Christians that live here, and praise God, we have freedoms that protect us as Christians, but Amen. you wait around long enough, we might not have those things, uh, might not have those things as long as uh, we would like to have them. But... I hate to ever agree with that man on anything, but he wasn't wrong about that one. All these denominations, they're, they're not just groups of people. They're groups of thoughts as well. So you have a, a, a different thought process happening in so many different buildings, so many different, uh, denom- so many different uh, uh, large organizations that, that span more than one building. You have so many of them. In this town alone, there are at least 25 different denominations represented in just this town. That, and that's a very conservative number. It's probably closer to 50 if we really, uh, if we really want to, but there's at least 25 that I've been able to go through and hand count. Where I'm talking about churches that have websites that have doctrinal differences listed on their websites. This, this isn't just a coming up with, a, with some kind of opinion in some random number. No, this is doing the research of, hey, this one believes something different, this one believes something different, this one believes something different. People get mad about it when you, when you, uh, when you point that sort of thing out. But hey, you know what? Things that ain't the same ain't the same. It just is what it is. But the likelihood is that is a more conservative number than I, than I realize. Because we don't, we don't really realize how many house churches are popping up. We don't realize things like that. And I want to just be completely straightforward, honest with you on here. As Brother Tim says, it's the only way I know how to be. There's different denominational teachings inside of the same churches. From Sunday school class to Sunday school class, People are getting, they get off on what saith the Lord and they start preaching what saith grandma or grandpa or what saith the, the preacher on TV, the one that your preacher tells you not to listen to but you listen to anyway. They, 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 they start preaching that. They start preaching what saith John MacArthur study Bible, what saith Tony Evans study Bible, what saith anybody study Bible, instead of what saith the Lord. And it happens inside of the same churches. The bigger the church, the more likely it's happening. But it happens in the small ones too. It's happened here before. It's happened. Pick a church. Pick your poison. It's happened. It's it's going on everywhere. And if a preacher stands there and tells you, "Oh, that's not happened in my church," he's a cotton-headed ninny muffin. That's what he is. That's what he's he's something. I don't know. He he's blind. He's he's willfully ignorant of what's going on. Because I'm gonna tell you what. When you got a Bible believing church like this church right here, it ain't nothing to have somebody come in and pose as a Bible believer so that they can start teaching something that ain't so. But it, they, there's so many different ones. They're, they're, they're based off of different rules, they're based off of different traditions. Some are based off of Scripture, praise the Lord. Nevertheless, there is a doctrine that sticks out to us. There is one in particular that sticks out amongst the churches, that they better make sure they got right. And I can tell you they don't. They, most of them do not have this doctrine right. And it's the doctrine of salvation. It is, it is a very simple doctrine. As simple as taking that water when it was offered. It is simple. But all the, the ranting and raving that I do as a, as a pastor about other churches and, and other pastors is because of their intentional tampering with the doctrine of salvation. Salvation is so simple that many people will miss it because they'll try to add their own spin to it. They'll, they'll try to make it just a little bit complicated 
And I, I really don't understand, some, understand why they would do that. So I want to talk to you today, and the first point I want to make, and yeah, I'm, I'm lining my sermons up in points now. For some, some people like that thing. I'm not partial to it yet, but I, maybe I'll get used to it. But the first point I want to make to you is, is it complementary or is it complicated? Now, what, what's being taught in the pulpit, is it complementary to Scripture or is it complicated? What's being taught in the Sunday school class? Is it complementary or is it complicated? 2 Corinthians 11 and 3 says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtly... So, that's, a, that's a rough word. I, subtly. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is Christ. That is in Christ. Genesis chapter 3, verse 13. Let's show you what, exactly what Paul's talking about here in 2 Corinthians. As the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. That means she was tricked. She was deceived, and she ate. And what Paul's talking about here in, in 2 Corinthians is that he's worried that you're going to be beguiled by people that look like they know what they're talking about. There's groups of people out there, and we, we've got a couple of uh, we got a couple in this group in this church today. Uh, I would include myself in this group, brother TJ, brother Tim. I, I would I would I, I would include y'all in this group right here as I, as I'm talking. There's a few more of you, but I'm calling them out by name because they're sitting here on my front row and I'm looking at them. Okay. There's meat eaters. Okay. We like we like that strong meat. We we like to. We like to get in there to where the, the nutrients is at and, and really dig down just a little bit deeper. And it, it, there, but there's, there's people like that. And there's, I've got a, one fellow that I'm thinking about, and I'll get to him in just a second here. But let me, let me read you what, what some Scripture says here. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. For when, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat." For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. That's a sweet thing to say about us, isn't it? But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of us have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So I was talking to Brother TJ about this the other day, as a matter of fact, and we were talking about how it would be nice to have, you know, a, a particular um, brother of ours that we, we um, that we know to have him come to the church and teach some Sunday school class for because because this fella goes deep on scripture. Uh, Miss Brittany Ms., um, and Tim know knows what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Cody Waters, I, and I asked Cody if it was okay to mention his name in in the sermon today because he's got a lot of people mentioning his name in the, in the wrong light right now. But I, so I asked him. I said, "Is it okay if I if I mention your name and?" Uh, you know, he says, yeah, just don't ruin it. <laughs> I said, too late, brother, too late. But me and TJ, we were talking about this, and th this brother's sharp. I mean, he is, he can be a little too sharp. I mean, he, we talk about that book, See a Glass Being Over Your Head, oh, Cody Waters can be over some heads. He does it intentionally, too, because he's drawing out. He's drawing those conversations out, and the people that he's doing that with are people that are supposedly on the strong meat of the Word. Now, I talked to Brother Cody about that, and I said, hey, well, if you've got a, a younger believer, I said, would you say the same thing? He said, oh, no. I don't know. He says, no. You, he, he agrees. Sometimes you've got, to, you've, got to, you've, got to, you've got to dumb it down a little bit. <laughs> you, not water it down, but you've got to make it to where it's understandable. Well, you've got to put it in layman's term. You've got to, you've got to do doctrine for dummies or whatever, whatever you want to call it. But you've got to you've got to know your audience, and I'm gonna tell you what, as a pastor in a church, one thing that 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 just baffles my mind is how people don't care if the children or the the babes in Christ are really getting anything. They'd rather sit up there and and say words that you don't understand. They would they would rather, you know, you pay a little bit more when someone um, says some says some things. Hey, I got my report from the uh, the doctor the other day. Brittany, what did they tell me I had? You hear this? Listen, listen. What's the scientific word for what the doctor said I had? You can't. I didn't think so. What's it called, really, though? 
fatty liver disease. <laughs> See, you pay more. See, you pay for that big word. You pay. You go to you go to that doctor. If you went to the doctor and said, "Hey, man, you're you're fat," you probably don't go to that doctor very much. Probably, hey, well, you're mean. I'm, I'm not going to be here. Yeah, All right. right. Yeah, I mean, you, when you when you sit there and you and you go to the doctor and and they they don't have that. You know that bedside manner, so the, so to speak. They don't they don't use the proper word. You know you might not be able to trust that doctor. Me personally, I'd rather have a cheaper doctor than a, <laughs> and one to tell me something that I know how to. I don't want the doctor to tell me what's wrong with me and me, and me have to say, well, what's that? Yeah. Like I know what WebMD says this because I've I've been googling it. But hey, tell tell me what does a uh, what does a uh, um, Jack down the street what does he say it is. I want to. I want to know in my own terms here. But our friend Cody Waters, the, he's a meat eater, and that's a good thing. It can be, and for him, it's a great thing. But there's meat eaters out there that all they care about is the fact that you know they're on meat, that they're not on that that milk of the word anymore. And I'm gonna tell you what they they trans they they transfer from being. Uh, we're being meat eaters to being just butchers of the word, and they start serving bad meat. They grew up. I'm not going to call the name of the store because they, it's been there's been some house cleaning and stuff done down there now. But there was a store I grew up in or grew up around. Everybody knew you don't eat from that store. You do not eat from that thing. They they never uh, they never changed the chili pot out. They just kept adding more meat to it. No, you got, they used bleach to clean off meat. I'm telling you, this thing was, they, they'd repack it. They'd buy old meat at one grocery store that was marked now. They'd use bleach to clean it. They'd repackage it there, and they'd turn around and sell that junk. I mean, you, I was back there in the back of the store one day. This old, old black lady, she was back there, and I, I was going to buy some steaks. And I, I looked now, I said, ma'am, I said, them steaks ain't good. And she said, you get them hot enough, it'll be good. <laughs> I said, great day. Great day. I ain't never... I tell you what, I, I, can't, I can't do it. I got a pack of hot dogs in the refrigerator at the house right now. It's been in there for a while because I got on a hot dog kick for a while. And then Brittany bought and loaded me up, and I had more hot dogs than I knew what to do with. And they got to the point where I thought, well, these might be going bad. So I'm just sitting there looking at them, seeing how long it's going to take Brittany to throw them away because... Uh, I don't want to throw away something she bought, but I was sitting there thinking to myself, well, it might be bad. I don't want no bad meat. And it, and worse than bad meat, I don't want no beyond meat either, so I don't know what's in it. That junk that they that Bill Gates is trying to serve everybody. I don't want none of that junk. I don't want none of that Scientology. I don't want none of that, that thing on Mormonism. I don't want none of that Jehovah's Witnessism. I don't want none of that garbage out there. I don't want none of that, none of that junk. I don't want any any strange fire around here. But these, these fellows out there, they, they're on the strong meat and they don't care if they're serving you bad meat as long as you know that they're serving meat. And I'm going to tell you what happens though. You get hooked on something artificial and you'll crave something artificial for a long time. I'm hooked on Diet Pepsis, I'm going to tell you. And I crave them things. I, Brittany gets on me, I drink a, I drink a Diet Pepsi like, like they're going to quit making them. And... I finally weaned myself off of Debbie cakes, but then I got hooked on an ice cream sandwich. I don't, I don't know what to do here. It's the, art, it's the artificial stuff. I wish somebody thought, of, thought enough of me to make me some homemade ice cream. Maybe they'd get me, off the, uh, get me off that artificial stuff. But all they want to know, they want you to know they're serving meat. They're the source of it. They want you to, they want you to come get it, and they, they could care less if it doesn't complement what the Word of God actually says. Acts 15 and 29 says, That ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves ye shall do well, fare ye well. I, I couldn't help but think about it right here that uh, Muhammad, or he claims that the angel, 600 wing angel Gabriel, come down and strangled him. The Bible tells us here to refrain from things that's been strangled, so we're going to refrain from, uh, from being Muslim. How about that? But, but look what it says here. It says, abstain from meats offered to idols. I mean, this is talking about an actual meat. This is talking about, this is talking about the, the dietary laws that are, that are out there for the Jews. 
But I'm going to tell you what, we need to pay attention and we need to be able to glean from that physical thing. We need to be able to look at it in a spiritual light and say, hey, these meat we ought to avoid as well and these butchers we ought to avoid as well. Now, we've talked about the meat eaters. Now let's talk about some other uh, culinary artists out there with the Word. We're going to talk about the sugar coders for a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, unlike the meat eaters, there's no good thing about a sugar coater. There's not, there's not a possibility of them being good. Today we live in a time where the most common approach to Jesus uh, is people try to make Him be some type of, uh, of tree-hugging hippie, some sandal-wearing, uh, just love on everybody, hug on everybody, that, that runs around telling everybody how much you love. Oh, I, I love you, brother. Oh, I love you. Oh, do whatever, do whatever you want. My name's Jesus. There's power in it. I mean, this is, the, this is basically what they're saying. They, they've really watered down the table flipping, um, uh, whip swinging Jesus. You, I, went to a, I went to a tough man fight last night. I done told you about it. They want not one of them tough enough to carry a cross up a hill like that while they, after they've been beat and beat and beat and beat. And ain't none of them tough enough to be able to, to get on that cross willingly and give His life for you. Ain't none of them. But they make Him out to be some kind of lovey-dovey, tree-hugging, hippie Jesus. No matter what they do, anything, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Run around on your spouse, go commit sins of Perversion. Do all do I, do any? Oh God loves you so much. He loves you. He loves you. He does. He does love you, but not enough to let you do what you're doing without paying, but without paying the consequences. He he's a just God, not a just love God. Now, I mean, I mean, you need to understand that. I just made that up. Now, you coined that, and we're gonna get a copyright on that. Put it on a T-shirt. We're going, to, we're going to do it because you know, I'm going to tell you what. Some somebody gets to preaching a little bit. They you know they, they want to they want to make their money off of whatever they're saying. They want to sell their books. They want to get their shekels. They want to do everything they can, and they want to do that so bad that they'll sugarcoat the word to tell you exactly what you want to hear. They could care less about what God wanted you to hear, but they they want to know what you wanted to hear. Eh? You're in the wrong place for that. This is not the Jesus of the Bible that the sugar coders are talking about. The, this tolerance and acceptance of what God calls sin has no part in salvation. Not only does it have no part in salvation, but it also has no part in sanctification. In fact, it's worth less than the word defecation. I you to think about it. Now, we've talked about the, the meat eaters. We've talked about the sugar coders. Now we're going to talk about uh, something that hits a little closer to home here. We're going to talk about the Sunday Christians, or as Miss Brittany likes to call them, the surface Christians. When, when Miss Brittany said surface Christian to me, I'm going to tell you, that thing, that was seared in my brain. I couldn't, I couldn't unhear it after that. I've always heard them called Sunday Christians, but the surface Christian, it added something different to it. Revelation 3 Verses 14 and 16. And unto, unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, this, this last group that we're talking about, is the, uh, is the group that's so unstable in doctrine, and they actually make up the largest group of professing believers, at least in America. This group believes that everything is fine as long as you add a little Jesus to it. They worship a Jesus that doesn't care about, about sin, 
as long as you show up to church on Sunday. At least one Sunday a month. Folks in this crowd, they're going to call you, if you're a Bible believer, they're going to call you a hater, they're going to call you a legalist, they're going to call you a know-it-all, they're going to call you a Pharisee, they're going to call you self-righteous, and they're, all, they're going to do all of that for the crime of quoting Scripture. Go to Canada right now. You cannot read this book in Canada. You cannot read it out loud. You will go to jail if you read Romans chapter 1 out loud in Canada right now in public. You are going to jail. And they're probably going to try to label you some kind of domestic terrorist. You go reading in the book of Leviticus, you will go to jail for reading this book in Canada. It's right up north, right? They're so tolerant. <laughs> Those guys, hey, they, what a knee slapper. Canada and tolerance. I think they mispronounce communism. Um, but none of this stuff, uh, none of these things that they're, that they're calling you, they're for, for any other reason other than to, to make you out to be a person that's evil for believing God's Word. Uh, oh, you're, you're judging me. No, the, you're born judged. I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you, hey, you've been judged. You might, you might, you might want to go down to the magistrate's office and clear your name because you've been judged already, Jack. That's how those judgments work. Y'all ever had anything hit your credit report that, uh, that you didn't know? That, well, you might have known about it or forgot about it, but it hit that credit report and there was nothing you could really do about it at that point, and so you needed to, to clear that thing off your, off your credit report. What, what, what you, ain't you going to try to clear something up there? If, I mean, get, get rid of that thing. You did it. Now get rid of it. They want to... But you can't tell nobody, hey, it's not the credit report's fault that you got something... It's not that, that some haji over there decided he wanted to, to steal your identity and buy something. It's not, the, it's not Equifax's fault. They just told you. And it's not my fault that you're doing whatever you're doing. I'm just going to tell you and point you to Scripture. And if you don't like it, you take it up with the Scripture. Go prove Equifax wrong. How about that? Scripture refers to this group as a Laodicean church. This is the last of seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. There are many different names that this church goes by, though. There's Sunday Christians. There's surface Christians. Sunday Christians, we understand that's somebody that's only at church on Sunday. You know, this is, this is Laodicean church members here. Only at church on Sunday. This, that doesn't make you a Laodicean church member. There, there are times when a fellow can't be at church. There's, I mean, one of our deacons is an over-the-road truck driver. There's going to be times he can't be at church. It just, it is what it is. Tim's got all kinds of uh, sickness going on. There's going to be times he's going to miss because of that. There's going to be times that I'm going to miss because I'm beat up and broke down and out, out of shape and falling apart. There's going to be times that that's going to happen. That doesn't mean you uh, look for those times to happen, though. But, you know, you got the Sunday Christians... Then you got surface Christians, what Miss Brittany called them, and that thing, that thing stuck out to me because this is somebody. The way she defined this word was wonderful. Is somebody that has the appearance of being a Christian, but they're not really a Christian. They, I mean, they'll they'll, they'll tell you they are. They they might walk around. They might they might uh, have their favorite Bible verse tattooed on them, and that's not against tattoos. I, I I've got tattoos. I don't the tattoo doesn't bother me. I'm not getting any more. But it doesn't, it doesn't bother me to, to see your tattoo. But you know, they have the appearance. They, they, they look like it. And this is kind of getting descriptive of what Satan would do uh, uh, masquerading as an angel of light here. I mean, they, they might walk around and they might tote a Bible. It's probably not a King James. But they might do that. I, I had a fellow the other day just... He, uh, he, he got uh, upset over, over me being King James only and, and he, has to send me a, he has to send me a message and tell me how, uh, how wrong I am and uh, this, this, that, and the other and while, he's, while he's walking around preaching false doctrine and carrying on. And I'm like, 
whatever, man. Like I ain't got no time for that kind of garbage. And I, and I told him, I said, I don't, have to, I don't have time to waste on somebody that's just wanting to waste time. That's it. You want to get in this book? You want me to show you what this book says? We can sit down. We can break bread. We can do, rightly divide the word together line by line, precept by precept. And if, and if we can't come to an agreement that the word says this, then I'll tell you, have a nice day. You can go on in your willful ignorance. Christmas and Easter only Christians or CEO Christians. You know, that's worse than a Sunday Christian. And uh, that's, that's not even close to a surface Christian. This is, this is coming to church. You know, they make you dress up special on Easter and, or Mother's Day. M Mother's Day is actually worse than, um, than Easter, in my opinion, because we, we live in a time where, where um, women are make up the majority of the church at this point in time. And, and realistically, um, there's nothing wrong with that. I wish it were the opposite, but... Hey, I'm glad the women are there at times. There was a time when this church was almost all women. It was just me and Tim and, and Matthew, and everybody else was a, was, a, was a lady there. But now we, we've, uh, we've uh, got some men here now. I was going to say attracted some men, but then somebody take that out of context, and I don't want to climb down that one. Though. But <clears throat> they've got this Christmas and Easter only where you got to, you got to drag them. Then you got the the lukewarm Christian. Mm. On the, after the lukewarm, we've got the progressive Christian. Mm. Progressive. Whew. That word makes me want to vomit. It, it really does. Then we have the tolerant Christian. We're starting to get into, uh, once we got there to progressive, and probably the Christmas and Easter only Christians, we're, we're probably getting into lost folks here. But these make up the majority of believers. i got to use the little uh, parentheses there. Quotation marks, whatever they are. But then you got the woke Christians. I'm not sure what that is. I don't know that, the, I don't know that they are. I don't, I don't know that they, they even... They're, they're in... So deep into la la land, they think they're awoke. You ever be like that? I know I be like that. In the morning, when I have to go to the bathroom, I be thinking I'm woke and I'm not woke. And I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen with some of these woke Christians. They gonna wet the bed, man. I'm, I'm gonna tell you, or worse. I've done worse before. That's what being woke in Christianity looks like. I've got a. Um, I've got a friend, another friend down in, uh, down in Florida, and she used one of the greatest examples of what this type of Christianity is when she was, uh, she was explaining it to me. She's a nurse. Her name's Ashley Howard, a good friend of mine, Billy's wife. And, um, and if they ever watch this, they share one Facebook, and people give them the devil about it, and I, I think it's funny. But Ashley told me one day, uh, we were talking about a bunch of kids getting saved at the Christian school, and I'm like, how is this even possible? These kids go to the Christian school, and how, many, how can you have this many salvations? These are Christians. They're Christian parents. And she says, it's the Jesus vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and this is before vaccine become a trigger word. Now, the word vaccine might get me booted off Facebook, so let's, uh, i got to be careful. I'm not, I'm not talking about the China flu. I'm talking, about the, I'm talking about what she referred to as the Jesus vaccine. And I'm like, what is a Jesus vaccine? And she said this when they've heard just enough about Jesus that they think they're safe and secure. Yeah. They've, they've been injected. That they, they've, had, they've, been, they've taken the, the Jesus jab. That's what I'm going to call it. I'm going to let her have the Jesus vaccine. It's the Jesus jab now. They've, they've taken that just a little bit. And how a vaccine works is they, they put something, um, they, they put a, a dead virus in you and that dead virus uh, helps you build immunities for a, uh, a, the real thing. I'm going to tell you what happens. They put some dead Jesus in you. They put a different Jesus in you. They put something that's fake. They put something that, that wasn't made in Wuhan. It was made over there in Rome. They put something in you that, that they, they want you to, to have this, this imitation Jesus, this, this convoluted, this complicated thing. And then you get to the point where, hey, your body starts building immunities towards the real thing. You think, hey, I've had, that, I've had the jab. I've, I've prayed a prayer. I've walked the aisle. I've raised my hand. I've, 
jumped and showered. I took a lap around the church, walked on pews. Got all that. All that through that little Jesus jab. Where did I get off to? I got off on my notes. James chapter 2, verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Mark chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Now these are demons that know who Jesus is. Do you think just because you've been exposed to some version of Jesus, had your Jesus vaccine or your Jesus jab, you because now you know who He is, you, you think just because... Because grandma was a Christian, mama was a Christian, daddy, grandpa, you think just because they were Christians that that you you're you're squared away because you've been a you know, I'm gonna tell you what, sin's hereditary, but Christianity is not. Right. You gotta get that on your own. You got you got to you got to come in contact with the Savior on that one. And you got to trust the Savior, or you're not gonna have the Savior. You can't depend on what church is on the corner of the road you live on. And y'all, I say that people believe they're saved based off of what church is on their corner. It, I'm telling you, go, go look at some of the stuff that's on Pew Research of what people believe saves them. It is, it is terrible. Believing that God exists and believing that Jesus exists doesn't save you. It separates you from some foolishness. It's one less thing you can be a fool over. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Just knowing that Jesus is the Son of God, knowing that, that God exists, it just makes you less of a fool. You've got to trust Him or you're still a fool. Now, let's talk about how simple salvation really is. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, there are many folks out there who zealously love the Lord, but they do not understand the Gospel. The Gospel is so easy and so simple that many people will miss it because they can't, they can't, it can't be as easy as the book says it is. Pride. Pride's going to be the number one reason that a lot of folks go to hell. People that refuse to rightly divide the Word, they'll miss the mark. Not for having um, too little faith, but for having too much faith. Now, y'all think about what I just said there. Don't, don't, uh, I know that's a complicated thing. It's not they have too little faith. They've got a lot of faith. But they've got too much faith in the wrong thing. You can have a little faith in the right thing, and that's all you need. But you start putting faith and trust and hope in the wrong thing, and you're going to be lost. So many people put their faith, hope, and trust in Jesus takes up 99% of it, and they get that other 1%. That's such a, well, that person's 100% lost. That's it. There's no ifs, no ands, no buts. It's either Jesus paid it all or you're lost. There's nothing you've done, nothing you've said, nothing you've prayed, nothing you've given. He did it all or you are lost. It's, it's clear. But pride is going to be the thing. People can't stand the fact that they didn't have something to do with it. Um, I want you to understand that in the church age, 
you're not going to find any works at all in the gospel. There's no baptism, there's no good deeds, there's no tithing, there's no church attendance, there's no lighting candles, there's no nothing but believing what Jesus Christ did was enough. So when we can't accept a simple salvation, we start getting into the doctrines of devils. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 3 says this, now the serpent speaketh expressly that in the latter times uh, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Folks are actively right now being deceived into believing things that are um, from Satan are actually from God. We're seeing false conversions happen all over the nation in record number. And this is a sign of the times. It's a sign of the times. It's a sign of us being inside of this Laodicean church period. Philadelphia church period's over. We're now inside the Laodicean church period where people are turning from the Word and they're turning towards these doctrines of devils. And you might be thinking, you might be thinking to yourself, oh, preacher... You ought not say that, that other, other preachers might be from Satan. Oh, I ought not? Okay. 2 Corinthians 11, 13, 15. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if, the, if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I want you to understand that Satan has ministers. The, the Bible used the word that, that, it, that it wanted to use here. It, this isn't talking about demons. This is talking about Satan's ministers. Anything that God has, Satan wants to imitate, replicate. He wants to duplicate it because he can't be it. He wants to do that. He has his own preachers. I would much rather you think that I'm one of his than to trust what I tell you. I would much rather... Uh, I, I, I would just rather you verify and check absolutely everything everything. I would rather you go home, watch these sermons, dissect them and say, hey, is my preacher really preaching the, the, the truth of the Word of God? And if you find where I'm not, bring it to me and show me so I can get it cleared up. And if I won't listen to it, take it to this man right here, take it to this man, take it to this man, take it to that man in the back, take it to this man over here, take it to somebody and say, hey, I told the preacher about this, he was preaching this wrong, I want to clear this up. This, this goes for anybody that watches on the internet too, if I'm preaching something wrong, bring it to one of these men. If you bring it to me and I don't accept it, if I don't accept it that it's coming from Scripture, I need accountability. But I'm going to tell you what, right now there is this, this spirit of unaccountability that's out there right now amongst preachers. They don't want to be checked on. They don't want to be called out. I, I, I mean, they, they something else, man. They, I mean, they're, these, I mean these, these folks, man, you, you would think whatever they're preaching is the oracles of God, and it's not. It's not. It, it's... It's something, it's something different. These are, there's doctrines of devils that are taking place here. And Paul was clear that it would be this way. And you say, well, oh, preacher, you're spending too much time trying to correct other preachers. If their doctrine was as bad as you say it is, people, people would be able to, wouldn't stick around to, to hear it. They, they would be able to see it for themselves. Really? Okay. Well, let's look at what Scripture says about that. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 4. I charge thee, okay, some, somebody's got some orders here. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, rebuke, excuse me, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come. Now, this is why. This is why the, the, the preacher has to call out the false doctrine. You don't like it. I mean, I'm sorry, you have a problem with Scripture. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust 
shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So why do I keep going back and why do I harp on what's being taught around here? Because I know that this is not the only group of people you interact with. I know you interact with people that are sitting under one of those 25 to 50 different denominations out there. And I know that if you're, if you're solid Christians, that you're going to be talking about the Lord from time to time. And I know that it's hard to have a conversation with somebody when they have differences of opinion and you're risking, you're risking offending them there. So I want you armed to the teeth with Scripture, with good doctrine, so that you can actually have those conversations and maybe help that friend out of that snare that they're in with that false doctrine. I don't, I'm not saying that the friend's lost, but I'm saying that there, there's plenty of them out there that have, have, are, have begun the process of turning away. You know, sanctification's a process. The opposite of that, the turning from it, that's a little bit of process too. You know, it, nobody starts off being a uh, being a, a drunk. They had to, they had to start off with a, with a sip. Nobody nobody starts off uh, addicted addicted to black tar heroin. It probably come from um, a Percocet and worked its way up. Nobody starts off being as big as I am. There's two Debbie cakes in a pack. You know that. And sometimes I go through both of them. Nobody starts off in the worst condition possible in, in anything other than sin. You, start, you do start off in sin in the worst condition possible. But nobody, nobody is starting off in the, in the worst case scenario of whatever situation they're in. It's a, it's a reverse type sanctification. And I've seen many people get, go to Bible-believing churches, leave Bible-believing churches because they're chasing the feeling. Oh, well, there's, there's nothing for the kids. The music's not that good. Blah, 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 whatever. And sacrifice all learning of Scripture so they can have a, a, a better vacation Bible school. It ought not be so. It is so. It ought not be. You say, oh, preacher... I've seen that church you're talking about. They're doing so much good for the community. They're feeding people. They got a uh, they got a prayer hospital. Uh, they got all kinds of stuff. Oh, they they having a food drive there at the church. Woo, they're doing everything. They 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 not they shouting and singing. They they're spiritual people. They're even, they're even talking in tongues. They're so spiritual. Even the women preach. Good grief! I've seen it, preacher. Yeah. Why should I avoid it? Something that looks so good. All right. Second Timothy three, five and seven. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I'm going to close with this. Satan wants to rob God of every ounce of glory that he can. And he'll go to almost any length to rob God of as many souls as possible. He'll use preachers. He'll use churches. He'll use false doctrines. He'll use denominations. He'll use seminaries. He'll use New Age Bibles. He'll use entire religions to deceive as many folks as possible. Some folks will fall into a, a trap of trusting something else other than the gospel. Let's look at what Scripture says here, with the Scripture we started with. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subdiligence. Sub that word's going to tear me up. Subdiligence. I can't do it, Tim. Subtlety. Subtlety. Thank you, TJ. Thank you, Waylon. So your minds should be corrupted 
from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he, if he hath cometh, if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well, might well bear with him. The whole idea of Satan is to creep in just a little bit to make you trust something outside of the simplicity that is Christ. There's one length, though, that Satan will not go to for you. Satan is not willing to lay his life down for you. But Jesus Christ did. God went so far that He sent His only begotten Son to die for your sins. And if God is willing to offer up a gift like that, what kind of sense would it make for Him to make you jump through some kind of hoop to get it? You think, you think about that for a moment. Why? Why would He make it complicated? Why would He make you... I've given you my Son! He died for you! Now I need you to jump through this hoop. I need you to drink this. I need you to drink this wine. I need you to go under this water. I need you to do. I need you to eat this piece of bread. I need you to. I need you to pray this way. I need you to raise your hand. I need you to walk down the aisle. I need you to do all this stuff. No. If I give my son for you, I don't want to hear anything you've got to say. Just trust that that's enough. What else do you want? You want a little bit of credit for what happened here? You want credit for this right here? For what my son did? You talk about plagiarism. You talk about not giving credit where credit's due. He died for you. And somehow or another... You think you're going to do more than that? You're going, you're going to contribute? He didn't do enough? Well, bye. Get away from me. That's what God's going to say. I don't, know, I don't know who you are. I don't want to know who you are. You ever have somebody make you so mad you didn't even want to know them no more? Wish you didn't know them. Wish you'd never met them. I'm going to tell you what. If my boy gave his life for you and you weren't appreciative, I wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to know me. And I'm going to tell you, if you think you got anything to do with you, you don't want to know God. You don't want to know His wrath. It's coming. You're going to know it. And it's going to come at your own amen if you haven't trusted in what His Son did and laying down His life for you. Revelation 22 and 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that a thirst come. And, whoever, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ alone for salvation, I'd like to invite you to do that today before it's everlasting too late. Salvation's simple. It's already been paid for. All you've got to do is take it. The way I took that water from Tim earlier. Father God, Lord, we come to You, Lord, today in the name of Jesus. In the name of all names, God. Lord, we thank You today for the reading and the hearing of Your Word. Lord, we thank You for the simplicity that is in salvation. Lord, we thank You for the simplicity that's in Christ, Lord. Lord, we thank You that You made it so easy. There's no hoop to jump through, Lord. There's only a Savior to believe in. Lord, we thank You for all that You do. Most of all, God, we, we thank You for sending Your Son to die on the cross for our sins, Lord. Lord, and I pray that if there be anybody here, Lord, that thinks they have anything to do with, what, with that, and I pray they realize that the only thing they had to do with it is you were thinking about Him when He did it. I mean, the saying goes, Lord, while, while He was on the cross, I was on His mind, Lord. Lord, I thank You for that. Lord, I thank You for all that You do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. These altars are open. Y'all got business to do with the Lord. I encourage you to come do it. Media will play softer. Okay, Siri. Y'all heard it. Siri's got to say.